The ocean is key for us. Life would not exist without it. And yet, we are damaging it. Designing policies for ocean sustainability requires accurate observations and scientific information. We cannot do the science that is needed and the observations that are needed to sustain the Atlantic ourselves. No one nation can do it. Building on the success of the Galway Statement, various countries decided to connect their initiatives to support a massive transatlantic cooperation. So in our dialogues with Brazil and South Africa, we saw an increasing desire for us to work together to mobilize the community in the South Atlantic and to build on what had happened in the North Atlantic. The Bellum Statement, together with the agreements with Cabo Verde and Argentina, constituted the next step in creating the All-Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, a group of countries from pole to pole, all with a common goal, enhancing marine research and innovation cooperation for the benefit of citizens. Our All-Atlantic Ocean Cooperation will ensure that research and innovation provide the solutions to the communities faced with a changing Atlantic Ocean, leading to a more sustainable future. Co-responsibility, co-ownership and co-implementation will be the pillars for tackling key common areas of interest. Working together to share resources and to collect data will map unknown territories, align budgets and maximize the benefits for citizens. These things in the oceans are very expensive you know, and the instruments that we use for research. So I think that together uh, we can be able to share the costs. But uniting countries is not enough. We are opening the initiative to society including the public, to build the All-Atlantic Ocean Research community. The, the policies it will only make a difference if the population itself understand why are you doing it. By collaborating with the youth to have ocean-engaged citizens from an early age, our alliance gives the next generation the tools to create a more sustainable Atlantic. There's a very good African saying that says, if you want to go far, you go alone. If you want to go further, you go together. So join us and help make our Atlantic a better, bluer place for all. Hello guys, uh, this is the All Atlantic Youth Ambassador uh, side event in the Ocean Literacy Festival. We're going to introduce ourselves in a funny fact about us. So I'm going to start. Yeah, My name is Utman Shalqawi Daqaqi and I'm from Morocco, the All Atlantic uh, Ambassador representing Morocco. And the fun fact about me is that I don't know how to swim. And actually, if you put me in water, I will sink faster than you can blink. And that is the funny fact since I'm working in the ocean. Yeah. Now, and if the ambassador can take the lead and say a fun fact about themselves. Hi, I'm Eloise. I'm the All Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassador for Belgium. And a fun fact about me is that I've moved countries 10 times and the longest I've lived continuously in one country is five years. Um, yeah, so I'll pass it on to Harriet now. Hi everyone, I'm Harriet. I'm the All Atlantic Youth Ambassador for Ireland. And my fun fact is that I have an irrational fear of seaweed, which is great for when you're swimming. <laughs> and I'll pass it on to Tando. Hi everyone, I'm Tando and I am the All Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassador for South Africa, one of three South African ambassadors. And my fun fact is that I um, occasionally howl. I will now pass it on to <laughs> Raqueline, who's laughing at me <laughs> so much. <laughs> 
So I'm Hakelin, I'm ambassador from Brazil and uh, I'm a researcher. And my fun fact is that I've met the Russian when I was being 20. Sorry, I was speaking Portuguese. <laughs> I'm Jillian and I'm one of the three Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassadors for Canada and my fun fact about me is that I actually enjoy running and I love running marathons and I just completed my 12th one. So uh, we're going to switch now to the first topic we wanted to discuss. It's about movies, art, podcasts and music and, and their relation with ocean. And actually I wanted to start with maybe talking about our favorite movies with ocean related topics and yeah i've already mentioned that one of my favorite movies is cast away and why it's my favorite because it's really scary because airplane crashes in water you survive then you have to live alone and yeah my scary is that you gather all my my anxieties together living alone living in a boat fishing and surviving sea yeah that movie really gave me anxiety <laughs> and yeah i've watched it when i want to feel anxious again <laughs> wait a minute who are you yeah and that's one of my favorite movies we can talk about him yeah if yeah eloise can go ahead and state her favorite movie yeah um a movie that i really like that i I think it came out last year, is My Octopus Teacher. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it. If not, you should. Uh, but basically, it's this uh, free diver, South African free diver, who kind of um, documents his journey of free diving off the coast of South Africa in cold water kelp forest. I mean, already that it's, it's beautiful to, to see. And basically, he meets this octopus one day. And then the next day, you know, decides, oh, I'll go back, see if I see the octopus again. And then finds the octopus again. And so for a whole year, actually, every day goes and dives and basically kind of builds a bond um, and gets the trust of this octopus. And it's just very interesting to see how his relationship with this marine organism that is, I mean, super smart evolves. Um, so, I mean, I would definitely recommend it for you to watch. It's just a great story to, to watch. Yeah. I think it's on Netflix, but I'm sure you can find it other places. I'd also highly recommend that film. It's amazing. It's really, really um, beautifully filmed as well. Um, I might mention my, my favourite ocean film is called uh, Song of the Sea. And it's um, an animated film, actually. And it's beautifully hand-drawn and directed by Tom Moore. And it tells the story of a young boy who discovers that his sister is mute. And then they discover that she's actually a selkie, which is um, a girl that can turn into a seal. And the whole film is um, how she has to save and free fairy creatures from the Celtic goddess Matcha. So I'd really highly recommend it. It's a beautiful film. And even though it's animated, I'm not usually an animation fan, but it's really amazing. And just a comment. I love this movie, My Octopus Teacher. I cried a lot <laughs> in the final of the movie. And uh, I, I think it's movie it's amazing because they show the relationship with the we are like the water with my arms are the water and i feel that when i swim and when i stay in contact with the water so i think it's amazing to to watch this movie and uh yeah don't cry <laughs> when this film ends <laughs> there's a lot of ocean movies but I have always loved Finding Nemo. I know it's a children's movie, but I feel like it's just one of those like feel good ocean movies. You see so much of like the diversity of the ocean in that movie, especially when they have to travel all that way. You get to see all the different ocean creatures, the different levels, whether they're small fish, how they all interact. So I think it gives like a really good understanding just of how all those ocean systems interact, how the different animals use the different currents and like how they've adapted to life and so I feel like it's kind of like a classic movie now <laughs> Finding Nemo but yeah I've always really enjoyed that one. My favorite yeah I have many thoughts about Finding Nemo but I must say the scenes with the um the turtles I'm um, using the current 
and to get around was probably one of my best scenes. <laughs> so cool. A few moments later. Another funny thing about me. So I used to work at the aquarium here in Cape Town. Um, and I used to dive a lot for them to like feed the animals and clean their tanks. And they have this beautiful honeycomb stingray in one of the, the big ocean exhibits. <laughs> and I fell in love with her so much that every time that I was in the water with her, because she's so big and regal and beautiful that um, I, in my mind, when I was feeding her, I'd pretend that we were having tea and we were having a conversation <laughs> when we totally weren't. So it, it's possible for you to have a conversation with a, with a marine animal if you're, if you're willing to have your imagination go there. But yeah, in a true way, I'm going to say this. I do talk to my dog and my mom think I'm crazy. I have super intimate conversation, like ask him about his day and say why he's mad, etc. And I see the look of my mom and she's saying, are you really talking to a dog? And I'll be, yeah, I'm talking to a dog. <laughs> That's completely sane. We all do it. <laughs> this question is off topic, but do you think the movies portrayed the ocean as it truly is? or they just use it as the benefit of their dramatic scene? I think initially, you know, when, when movies were make, being made and they would kind of focus on the ocean, I do think I agree that a lot of the time is negative, no catastrophes, um, or, or, you know, like jaws with um, sharks coming to kill everyone and all of that. But I do think now more and more it's kind of switching um, because people are becoming more aware about the oceans. And so I do think it depends, you know, I think documentaries are a great way to, to showcase the ocean and get people talking about and advocating for the oceans in a positive ways. Um, and I mean, you see that in um, My Octopus, what's it called, My Octopus, The Octopus Teacher, or even um, in David Edinburgh's, um, is it Blue, Blue Ocean? No. Can somebody, does somebody remember what it's called? Atlantis, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Two planets. Um, I mean, I think that's a great example of really showcasing what the ocean is all about and how not only is it, you know, amazing for biodiversity of all of that, but also showcasing how it's important for us and for humanity and the earth and the planet and all of that. So I think it's it's starting to switch more. And I feel like we see less and less movies that are about sharks attacking people because I think people are just, you know, people are just over that. And people are more interested in really seeing what the ocean really does and what it brings to us as, as a society. I completely agree that I think with the increasing knowledge that what we're portraying on the screens is changing. However, I think we all know people who've probably watched just, just Jaws and that's the only reference they have of the ocean. 20 years on, they're still worried that if they put their toe in the water, that that's the end for them. So I actually think on the other hand, we, or not we, well, we as ocean activists or people who, you know, in the film industry have a responsibility to actually go out and sort of reframe that narrative. Um, because I, <laughs> I mean, I, so many of my friends, you know, their only references, I mean, there was this terrible, I don't know if you guys remember this movie called um, uh, Deep Blue Ocean, um, and it had like that old Cool J in it. And anyway, it was really, really bad, but I've watched it like 20 times. I don't know why, um, but it was, you know, they, it was an offshore rig where they were doing tests on um, sharks and, you know, big catastrophe, sharks broke out and just started like hunting people. Um, and yeah, so I think that if that's the only movie you've watched and maybe that puts you off watching anything else regarding, regarding the ocean, then you just carry that feeling for a really long time. <laughs> and unless you watch something else that convinces you otherwise, that's the only narrative you have. Um, so I think for us as ocean people, yes, we do see the change, but for other people, they probably still like, there's just sharks lurking on, you know, or just on the other side waiting. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's why it's so important and why it's great for us to talk about, you know, our favorite movies and all of that. And, you know, I think at the end of this, we'll, we'll 
put a list out with all our favorite movies and all of that and documentaries so that you guys have have resources to, to kind of go and check out um, some movies that are really great and advocating for the ocean and portraying the beauty of the ocean rather than just seeing it as a gloomy machine or a gloomy space that is going to destroy all of humanity. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Yeah, 100%. Just like you said, Eloise, like Blue Planet. I mean, the documentaries that are coming out now are absolutely phenomenal. Um, and we're discovering, like, everyone just gets to be at the forefront of this exploration age where you know we've got people in um you know submersibles going down like so far deep in the ocean where we wouldn't have even thought of and we just get to see it at, you know while chilling at home and <laughs> having some tea so yeah i think it's yeah it is it's we should share all of this stuff so people can go check it out as you said 100 percent later there's actually i can't remember if it's blue planet or not but um there's the episode that was on Antarctica, I believe, and they took a submersible along like the iceberg and you see the krill and everything. My deep sea professor was like in that submersible. Um, yeah, so I can't remember if it's if that footage was used for Blue Planet or not, but um, I saw it somewhere and actually, I'll find the video on YouTube and put it in the link because um, it's just it's an amazing video to see as the submersible sinks like uh, parallel to the to the iceberg and as they turn on the lights you see all these krill everywhere and the the life the, the I mean the the bursting life that you see at the bottom of a of the Antarctic seafloor is just amazing so I'll, I'll find that the thing that I love about movies right now is that however they seems to send an image about the ocean they speak about the ocean even if they're gonna use it dramatically they're gonna use it actually maybe it's our job to give now more ideas about how the ocean should be put, uh, given an image to how it be, should be shown to people a few moments later yeah i can now i can like switch us from the the movies to a song speaking about a lover she had she said uh, i'll be waiting for you as waiting for the sea to leave and because the sea will never leave so she will never leave him of her thought and that was like super romantic or am i just dreaming of it that's in the romantic skills that's ocean deep <laughs> yeah I, I i think yeah when when we speak about i think almost when we speak my family or my region when we speak about the ocean it's really this romantic uh, poetic way because it has something that not every place has. It is this deep confidential places where you go and you pour your hearts out, maybe spell your deepest fears, secrets, and you will feel at ease because it, the sea has no secrets, so it will not hold grudges against you. You can speak anything and it will be moved with the water. And this is so beautiful to me because when the, the, the song stated that, it really it really gave me a new meaning for love and for uh, loving someone. First of all, I think that's beautiful and I definitely want to listen to that song. Is it, what language is it in? It's in Arabic. So yeah, I, we, we could, I can send you the translation later. I, will... I mean, even, I'd still love to listen to it. I'm sure it's still beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's so beautiful. Um. I'll share quickly a song. Um, so mine's actually French. Um, it's by this French singer called Nolwenn Leroy. And basically this song, um, it's quite, I mean, an old song. It's from 2012, so it's almost 10 years old. But um, I've like loved it all, always. And it basically talks about ocean pollution and refers the whole, so the song is called Le Sixième Continent, which is the sixth continent. So it refers to the Pacific Garbage Patch as the sixth continent. And um, one of my favorite lines in it, in it um, is, il tourne et tourne dans l'océan, le sixième continent, continent, so that is, it turns and turns in the ocean, the sixth continent. And then, sur six sillons, le goéland crève de faim l'estomac plein. So it's basically talking about how the seagull 
um, dies of hunger with a stomach full. So um, I just really love that song because it really talks about ocean pollution. And I mean, back in 2012, I mean, that's not that far off, far in the past, but I do think it's, it's a great message that it um, portrays. And I think her whole album is about the ocean and all of that. So and it's very kind of folklore as well because um, she's from, I believe she's from um, Brittany in France. And so some of her songs are in, um, you know, local dialects. Um, so yeah, it's a great song and I love it. I'll also add it to the list. I mean, there's so many, when you think about it, it's actually there's so many songs about the ocean. Um, even, yeah, like spanning all genres of music. There's people are just speaking about the ocean, which for me is kind of testament to really everybody somehow, whether it's like consciously or subconsciously, they feel this deep connect to this blue space, um, which is so beautiful. Just like as often said, it's somehow we, you know, we understand the ocean on a way deeper level and it understands us at a deeper level as well. Um, and there's just like the subconscious learning. Some, you know, you, you could use an adjective, you know, when you just say the depths of the ocean, you can almost like feel how deep and like how robust and you just feel that that sentence like way better than any other sentence if you're talking about something that is you know really like intimate or um you know really profound um and I think that for me is always what's really really cool when I listen to not 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 music that is particularly like speaking about the oceans but has you know references to the ocean um, I, like I'm a I'm a spiritual person. I and my mom is really spiritual as well, and I always really love um, the references to the ocean when you know just during song and praise, um, you know about the depths and you know you know I I subscribe to Christianity, so you know the depths of the love of God or whatever it is, um, and that always touches home for me very easily. Um, yeah, so I think it, for me, I think it's the reference to the ocean that everyone can make in their own context, which is equally beautiful um, versus like one specific thing. Because um, even the song that Eloise just mentioned is super cool. Because as she said, you know, like 2012 is not that long ago, but also someone in 2012 was already referencing, you know, this, this challenge that we all face, which is ocean pollution. Um, and they made it into an art. So yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. It's really nice to see that there is some songs about it because the ocean's such a calming presence as well. And I know we talked a lot about catastrophe, often, but um, it's such a calming presence for a lot of people. And it's nice to have that um, in song as well. Yeah, I would say that most of the um, songs will use the ocean because of its calmness and etc. However, now we can move about painting and art. Uh, yeah, this is this is looks amazing, but I'm in love with a TikTok account that posts uh, her video painting oceans. And when she finishes, you would swear it's a picture, not a drawing. And I'm, I would make sure to put it on the list. It's so amazing that I'm really wanting to buy one of her paintings. I just want to buy it and Put it on the ceiling so every time I wake up I will see it <laughs> yeah I will love it I will love that piece of the ocean not the real ocean just that piece of the ocean yeah because you can look at it you don't have to go in it <laughs> there's um a girl who I follow as well on social media and she actually went to the same university I did but we didn't overlap at our time there but she's become an ocean artist and she takes a lot of her field work pictures that she did and now has turned them into art pieces. And I believe it was in January, she did a challenge where she painted a whale every single day. So for the month of January, she painted 31 whales and it was amazing. And so like, I love her artwork and I think it's so beautiful and it, yeah, it's really neat. Yeah, I think I follow her on Instagram as well. I discovered her like early this year and I yeah. remember the challenge where she was painting a different type of whale dolphin every day and you would yeah. get to vote for which one you would do yeah it's amazing it's so yeah. well done yeah. yeah 
her artwork's beautiful and she's selling it all now too so like you can go and purchase it so it's really neat see an ocean degree you can go multiple ways with it you can use field work to inspire art (laughs) during the last year in Galway actually they had a um a whole load of art all around the city on on walls and it was Galway city under water so a lot of them was um you know the Spanish arch down by by the ocean here and it was you know the arch full with water both going through and everything and it was really um dramatic and beautiful to see it when you go around the city you know all what climate change can do and sea level rise and everything obviously not the most uh, fun topic but it was a really great great way to show it through art as well um here in the city that i live in in cape town we have a local artist a graphic designer and she um does these amazing murals on the walls by the tidal pools that we have. And she um, sort of like, she draws and paints the, she says them, they, she calls them like meet the locals. And it's, the, it's like the common organisms that you would come across in the tidal pool. And so when you go like for a snorkel or a swim, you'll see like a nudibranch and like an octopus or whatever it is, but it's like these massive wall murals um, that you know you get like an enlarged nudibranch and and it's it's so beautiful and recently they've had um she just did a a new wall and they had it blessed with one of the the um, indigenous chiefs which was so special for us because it spoke to you know um acknowledging the indigenous people on the coast that you know were here in South Africa or you know are here in South Africa um and just you know recreating a space where everybody belongs at the tidal pool um which was really really beautiful and so that was like almost like a spiritual meeting art um space which yeah which is yeah it was amazing yeah i have one here in my city here the rivers it's like a the street so you can visit this different islands and uh, when you use the boat to see the the houses and the forest you can see in the middle of, of them a draw beautiful jaws of indigenous people or jaws of uh, doing something in our daily so it's magic magic and you can see different places based on that and it's really 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 beautiful jaws on the alls and the on the top of the houses it's amazing do people like give permission do like you can draw on my roof i would totally do that i'd love my roof to look so beautiful <laughs> yes they the, the people like to to have your house painting so it's amazing it's a, it's a collaborative project when invite uh, the, the the painters yes and the children of the island could paint your houses too. So it's like a, a festival. It's it's uh, amazing to, to see uh, all of them working to to have your house more beautiful than before. A few minutes later. Art, whether you know it's music or whether it's paintings or drawings or filmography, I think it's able to capture the ocean so well. Um, I mean, if you just have a look at these amazing documentaries, and I think it's such a good and such an important tool to convey the ocean to people that aren't able to, to be near oceans. I mean, because that's, that's a, a, very big, uh, a very big amount of people all around the world don't have access to the ocean and are, are landlocked. And I think being able to convey how beautiful the ocean is and how important it is to protect it even to those who can't see it in person is so important and I think art is able to really really do that. I do think that there is a small bias as in if you do live you know by the ocean you're and you're brought up by the ocean you're more aware of it in that sense and you know you're more likely to to act to advocate and protect it but I don't think you know, it's an all or nothing. And I don't think being far from the ocean should make you care less about the ocean. Because you see, I mean, 
when you read about the history or the life of a lot of marine biologists and oceanographers and ocean advocates, you actually realize that a lot of them weren't, didn't grow up near the ocean or anything. And that almost was, you know, what fueled them to want to discover the ocean, the ocean more. And I see Jillian pointing to herself, so I'll let her talk about it. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I'm from Ontario, which is in the middle of Canada, right? What's not on a coast? I mean, if you go to northern Ontario, you, you can get closer to like the bays, um, like the Hudson's Bay. But I traveled when I was young. I was fortunate in my family. We traveled to the east coast of Canada and we also traveled to the west coast. So I got to see both sides of the ocean and there was just there's just something special about it. So, yeah, I left Ontario and moved moved to Nova Scotia. and I've stayed here ever since because it's, there's just, there's just something about the ocean. I find it very calming. There's just, there's so much diversity in it. And even within Nova Scotia, one, the ocean looks so different depending on where you are in the province. Like when you're in like the farthest Northern point of Nova Scotia is a place called Meat Cove. And we traveled there last summer and you don't even feel like you're in Nova Scotia anymore. Like it's just, you're in these massive hills and mountains and all you see is water. And so you almost feel like you're in a different, in a different place. And so I kind of feel like the people who are exposed to the ocean or who live close to it almost feel this like stewardship to it in a sense, because especially if you're seeing it every day or if it's in your backyard, you're, you're more apt to notice the changes or when you talk with people who have always been on the water like the first nations here who have constantly used the water around the province they'll tell you changes that they've noticed over time and so I find there's almost this stewardship when you are that close to the ocean um it's not to say that like I can send my mom a picture of the ocean and she'll go oh I wish I was right by the ocean right now so you do have like that connect when people find it so beautiful and so vast but I definitely at least I have found through my work people who are on the ocean every day or who are using it for work or for just, you know, recreational purposes, almost have like a stewardship to it because they enjoy it so much. They don't necessarily want it to change or to not be there anymore. So, yeah. I really like what you said about the change because I've been lucky enough to be a couple of kilometers away from the ocean my entire life, which is like incredible, but it's those changes, those small changes, especially my local beach growing up, it had um, it was like really, really eroded. So every time that I would go back, it would just be a couple of inches further back and further back and further back. And if you hadn't been there every couple of days, every few weeks, you wouldn't notice. But living beside it and seeing it every time you go, you really do notice and it makes you more passionate to protect it, I guess. <laughs> when you live far away from the ocean, you have this hunger just to go there. And when you're there, you enjoy it fully. Us being lived a few kilometers away, if we don't see it today, we're gonna say, ah, I will go tomorrow. You have this, we have this luxury. But once you live further from the ocean, I had the, the opportunity to go a few weeks abroad and be far away from the ocean. I, the first thing I said, when I will be back, I will go and just put my feet in the sand, see the waves, see this beautiful ocean, and just enjoy it as much as I could. And we need to enjoy it. And by enjoying it, we need to make it sustainable, durable. And this is we make it for the next generations to come. Yeah, I agree that there's just beauty to, to the ocean where you can live by the ocean your whole life and never get bored of it. I mean, I love to just sit on the beach and stare at the ocean and some people They'll, they'll look at me and be like, what are you looking at? I'm like, well, nothing. I'm just, <laughs> it's almost, it's just, it's so, to me, at least it's so calming and peaceful. As you said, you know, when you, when you go somewhere that's further away, you always feel this draw to the ocean. And I think it's the same way for people who don't live close to the ocean, who then go see it. And then again, get so drawn to it. And like with Jillian, then just, you know, move to Nova Scotia to study and be by the ocean and work and to protect and sustain them. There is a saying in Morocco that well, I translated, will not say it in Arabic. It says that uh, the ocean will make you hungry. And I've noticed that once I will go to the ocean, I will feel more hungry and I want to eat. <laughs> I like, I can't tell you 
so no <laughs> I can't tell you how much I eat just because I, I I'm by the ocean almost every day and it's and for me it's always like starchy things but if you catch me nowhere near the ocean I like I don't even eat like croissants or bread or but somehow when I'm there that's the only thing that I want like <laughs> it's, it's crazy it's um I just remember so when I was younger and, and in high school, my best friend and I used to, um, for for um, Christmas holidays, because Christmas here in South Africa is during the summer. And so we basically spend endless days in the sun. And that's how we'd spend our holiday. And all we do is pack like hot dogs and chips and like a lot of water um, and maybe like 20 Rand for a brownie. And we would just sit in the sun and eat and then go play in the waves and then come back and eat and sleep or read a book and then eat again. And we just do that every day from like sunrise to like sunset. And then we're like, okay, we have to go home. And then it was just the same thing. Our parents just had to buy us like more and more hot dog rolls. <laughs> it was just, it was, yeah. <laughs> like when you're doing field work, it's the fresh air, you know, <laughs> it just makes you hungry. <laughs> The soul yeah, there as well. Uh, that's uh, to you. <laughs> I, uh, whenever I, I go out to see for work, um, they always make um, French fries. I mean, Belgium, but they always make fries because you always get so hungry. And they'll come out with like a grilled cheese or fries and be like, hey, what's we have this? I'm like, yes, give it all. <laughs> so for me, it's, it's not anymore, but it, it was a challenge because it, how be oceanographer in the middle of the Amazon <laughs> where we, we can see a, a, a ocean, a blue ocean, a salt ocean. Yeah, so for a long time ago, I, I was questioning myself about my professional or like in a, in a, in a, my relationship with the ocean. And uh, yeah, I, I can say for, for, the, for you that the ocean starts near our home, in a river near our home. So my relation with the ocean starts in the river. The river flows until the ocean transports nutrients, food, a lot of things. And uh, when I see that, when I, I, I realize that, I can see, whoa, the ocean started here, it's near me. So I try to, to talk about the ocean for my family, my friends, uh, following this line of, uh, of thought. Yes, because yeah, I live in the biggest river of the world, the Amazon River. So they, they, it, have, it has a lot of influence on the tropical Atlantic. And uh, yeah, I try to, to thought this way. <laughs> I, I think it's so important um, because it's true. It's true that it's, you know, the water, it's the water cycle essentially. And it's, it, you know, it, it transforms and moves in, in different ways and in different bodies. And this is one of the things we're trying to teach the kids that I work with is that, you know, river health is ocean health and ocean health is river health. And they're all connected and they're equally important and we should worry about them the same way. So I think, can, yeah well done and continue to to sort of like paint that picture for everybody because it's so important to have that bigger picture in mind than you know the ocean is just the coast and then like all of the you know pelagic and the open ocean it's also our rivers and estuaries and lakes and all of that stuff yeah in Nova Scotia we have several of our big river systems are tidal rivers and so like you'll see the rivers go in and out with the tides and like even last week when we were doing field work because in the Bay of Fundy where it has like the world's highest tides they have what they call the tidal bore so when it comes in it's basically looks like this ginormous wave and sometimes it's really like really massive and looks really cool and then other times people say the bore is a bore because sometimes it's really not that exciting um, but like even last week we were out in what anybody would just see as like a regular river but the tidal bore came in so you saw this like big gush of water come through and it's like that's how interconnected they are 
the and like that's tidally influenced river so yeah it, it's really neat to see how all interconnected they are has anyone ever tried to to surf the tidal wave or because <laughs> i know like i think there's i think there's some areas um i'm pretty sure there's in the uk because there's where my master's was where they have these waves that come into the rivers that are affected by the tides and you get these people that like take their kayaks and their paddle boards and actually are able to just surf upstream a river yeah. on these tough waves. <laughs> they go, they have tidal board rafting. So you basically go out, wait for the board to come in and then you just raft in. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty neat. It's like whitewater rafting, but in the ocean. <laughs> it was uh, shared with me once, um, that uh, if you cut a tree down on the land, you're killing a fish in the sea. And it was just kind of that expression to show, you know, how everything is so interconnected, like impacts that happen on land are gonna be experienced in the sea, in the ocean, not necessarily know how, but it is all kind of interconnected and has an impact, you know, you see, yeah, it, it's really interesting how it is all connected. I think what like always um, comes back to my mind about this, um, you know, relationship between us and the natural environment, whether it be like terrestrial or marine, is that um, the most basic thing in our life is our breath. And, you know, we can attribute two thirds of our breath to the ocean. And it's not even like, obviously, we love the mammals, we love the whales and the sharks, and, but it's these tiny microscopic things. We can't even see them and they literally give us life. And the way that they give us life is not even like, it's not their intent. It's a byproduct of what they do. They are literally trying to make food for themselves to survive and their byproduct is oxygen. And we're like, yes, like we <laughs> will take that. Thank you. We need that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we actually need that. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you sit and think about it, anybody can relate to the ocean in that way. You can be sitting in the most remote space far away from the ocean and you have the ocean to thank um and vice versa right we're so interlinked with the space um in so many different ways it's you you could never deny it um yeah and i mean amongst all the other things i think for me that is what i always think it's literally like the breath that i need every single day <laughs> comes from this tiny thing that I don't even see when I go for a dive. I kind of have to like take a water sample, go back to the lab, find a microscope, <laughs> just be like, oh, hey, little dude, thanks so much. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, even to like how we're all connected, like with the Ocean Ambassador Program, the reason we've all become connected is our love of the ocean, whether it be from like the mathematics, from the biology, from like the macrofauna, the microfauna, it's all brought us together. And we can have these really interesting conversations on an international level from all kinds of walks of life, but it's connected us all, which I think is something that's really, really cool. A few minutes later. Probably. I think we could move here to a, a funny session about uh, given translation to uh, ocean related topics. And yeah, when, when, when Jillian mentioned sharks, I was like, and what the translation of sharks in Arabic? And it was, and it was simple. It was Kirsch, which is three letter word, Kirsch, which is sound like shark. But then my mad wit, what is it in French? It's requin you found that they're close yet they're different in their own way so uh, Hakalin, what is shark in portuguese if you're gonna give us this yeah tubarão <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's completely different i was i was waiting for something close to shark to be honest <laughs> Yeah, and and yeah, on the same note, what is ocean actually? I think, yeah, uh, ocean, ocean should be the same for all of us. I'm, I'm maybe I'm just wrong. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it is. It's oceano. Oceano. Yeah. It's, yeah. For, for, 
for Arabic it's it's maybe but not all it's muhit muhit which mean being surrounded by uh, it's come from the well not from the translation from both being surrounded by which is muhit with southern m yeah it's really so now probably we should do the opposite someone says a word in their own language another will try to guess it it should be ocean related topic avoid catastrophes if needed do whale <laughs> <laughs> yeah i actually think whale might be somewhat similar in a lot of languages as well because of like so in french it's baleine yeah baleine comes from baleine um you know the, like the the whale baleine so i don't know what is it in like portuguese for example ah baleia it's baleia <laughs> Yeah, so it's almost the same as Belen in French. Belen, yeah. Um, what is it in completely the... different <laughs> for all yeah, it's, it's really confusing because it's fish. Yeah, it's the translation of fish. So it's hood, three letter language, which is hood, and it's fish. The translation of whale is fish, it's hood. They're just like a big fish. <laughs> oh, what's, what's fish? It's hood. <laughs> it's the same translation. Oh, so fish and whale I have just, the same name? Yeah. I'm just confused now. <laughs> I've always thought they were different. Do you know the, the Irish for whale, Marriott? Or is that too too niche? Too niche for me. I, I can just... Uh, fish is yes. This would be super tricky. I'm, I just think it, what is, what is dolphin in our languages, perhaps? And I guess this would be super easy. I feel like in French, it's the same, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's dauphin, so it's, it's yeah. Yeah. basically the same. So in Portuguese, it's so different. It's golfinho. Yeah, and Arabic is just the same as English, so it's delphine. Later. And I think also the, the fact that a lot of these names are similar is just because a lot, I mean, it's kind of a common practice when you're, you discover species to, to give it a Latin name, scientific name, and then a lot of these different languages then use this, this scientific name to kind of give it wow. a common name yeah the first nations community um that we work with they're Mi'kmaq and all of their words are verb based language so the words are like describing so whenever there's a word for something it's like a description of of what it is so it, it's really neat so it's like when you're saying the name of it, it it's kind of defining what that species or animal does yeah that's great to kind of be able to get a descriptive of what it is and if you haven't seen the animal if the word the the name for it describes it it kind of gives this whole imagery to it which is amazing i really like that one of the fellows we work with published like he's published a few books and does some artwork so like this one is all about insects and so like for moth the Mi'kmaq word for moth means looks like a little owl so the actual word for moth describes that yeah. so like it's the same for like anything really for any of them like a bed bug you smell a bed bug before you see it so like that's what the word so it's really just interesting how it's so descriptive yeah one eternity later we've talked pretty much about all topics <laughs> all topics were discussed here probably we should move for like closing statements from us of closing statement from the ambassadors as a whole and probably I should before saying the whole statement we should gather that our main uh, slogan that we went for uh, today was that uh, scientists are like you so meaning that you're not alone that scientists like us today from different backgrounds are gathered with their coffee tea speaking about interesting <laughs> movies topics and yeah having fun because uh, if you don't have fun you will not give your must and your heart to it and this is what we're here to do is 
yeah sharing the little details the funny details but in our love for the ocean that gathered us here yeah i mean i just want to kind of take it back to something something Fernando mentioned you know about the the ocean providing oxygen for us so if we all just you know you breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out and just thinking about this it's unconscious activity we do 24 7 to stay alive but i think we have to be more conscious about the fact that every other breath we take comes from the ocean and therefore protecting conserving advocating for these oceans that are so important is one of one of the vital activities we should be doing um and i hope it empowers you guys and you know makes you want to to protect and join us on this conserving and advocating adventure we're on right now and i think another thing too is there's so many there's so many different realms that you can get involved with ocean work or where you want to go in the ocean from anything from working directly with species to doing like oceanographic work to being out on research vessels to doing stuff in a lab like there's just such a broad range and i think a lot of people think when you think of ocean work, a lot of people think like in the water on a boat or something where really that's like we've talked about, that's just a small percentage and there's just so much that you can do. And I think another thing about the ocean too is there's more of the ocean that hasn't been explored than has been explored. So like to think about that and to just think of all these species and all this information that we're still, we still haven't learned yet and that we're still discovering as technology advances and as people start going into these different areas of focus and study. I think it's something that's really exciting to think about that there's still so much we have to learn, even though we feel like we, we know so much about the oceans, there's really still so much that we can learn. Yeah, and with that, I mean, it's not just it's not just a job for scientists as as we've talked about it's artists and filmography and music or policy you know governmental work anything really it doesn't you don't have to be into science necessarily to get involved in ocean protection and exactly like anyone who would watch this could be a potential ocean activist it's not about how close you live to the ocean or about how much interested you are. It comes with smaller steps, smaller steps, then bigger steps. And your love for the ocean, you will, you will nurture it with working with the ocean, working with ocean activists, hearing talks, talking with people, finding good company. And believe me when I say this, that uh, maybe you're scared of the ocean, maybe you don't know much about the ocean, but once you meet some people who are love the ocean that will make you automatically fall in love with it because it has some attraction factor that makes you laugh smile have a good mood when it, the topic is around i think that's a perfect segue into the slogan that we pick scientists are like you you know we all at one point didn't know anything and now here we are being activists and ambassadors for the atlantic so I think it's you can start from anywhere. Yeah, I guess I, I always say to people that, um, you know, if you have a question and you're curious enough about it and you find the answer, whether the answer sort of like proves your question or observation or it disproves it and it's like, no, it's not really what happens. You're a scientist and you don't necessarily need a degree and you don't need a diploma. And you, just the fact that you're questioning and you're exploring means that you're a scientist. And so I think for me, this is important because it allows everybody to be in the space of being curious and exploring and loving the ocean, which I think is so important for me because often, you know, the space can, you know, exclude a lot of people and exclude a lot of communities. And we all belong, right? We all belong in our very special ways to the ocean and that it belongs to us and in that very special way too. So I think for me, the parting words are that um, everyone's experience of the ocean is valuable and we can use it in this concerted effort to um, really be custodians for this blue space. Um, and you should never doubt um, your relationship with the ocean because it really, it really does matter. Um, and everyone can use it in and moving forward and into um, getting healthy oceans. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Andy Run can be a scientist. You can, I think you can, for example, for those who live uh, far away from the ocean, like me, <laughs> you can investigate uh, about your, the river, for example, near your home. Uh, do you know about the, the story of them, about the, the people who lives there? So you can investigate it. so many things about the water, like rivers, lakes, terraries, mangroves, beaches, and uh, think that uh, these uh, spaces are related to ocean too. It's not exactly only a blue uh, crystal transparent water with the rivers, dolphins, but you can see the ocean in any places. So I think that we've talked about a lot and I think this would be the ending of our <laughs> uh, Ocean Literacy Festival. I would like to thank all the uh, ambassadors that six months ago we were completely strangers and now we're gathered on a call <laughs> speaking about our love for the ocean. I would like to thank you so much for being here today with us to share in this love of the ocean with our viewer, potential ocean next ocean ambassadors next ocean scientists and yeah it is it was really lovely to have this talk i also just wanted to mention quickly that um we'll have some more events that us as the youth ambassadors Atlantic ocean youth ambassadors are organizing and we're hustling and bustling to get these up and they'll be coming up soon in june so um on june 2nd we've got um a some of us discussing um a what is it a a side event to identify and discuss barriers faced by early care professionals um and brainstorm brainstorm how to overcome these so this will be on the 2nd of june um as part of the all atlantic 2021 conference um we'll also have a side events um or an event that we're working on with the virtual early career virtual early career ocean professional virtual early <laughs> career professional um, that is coming up soon but we will um link all of this info and give all of you access to to how to participate and how to yeah join in on these events and listen to us and get involved in all of that yeah exactly we will leave all this information at the end of this video and yeah See you at our next event. Hopefully we will have you there with us. Thank you so much.